Hello, everyone. Welcome back to StatTech Research's seminar series on measuring progress and well-being. I'm Kelsey O'Connor, one of the organizers. Today, we are pleased to welcome Professor Talita Grayling, who will discuss big data, sentiment analysis, and subject well-being. Talita will speak for approximately 40 minutes and then address questions at the end, at which time, please raise your virtual hands or post your questions in the chat. During the presentation, please keep your microphones muted. And uh, today we're asking if you could keep your cameras off uh, just to conserve bandwidth. Uh, at the end, you can turn your cameras on when asking questions. Uh, and a last reminder, we are recording the event. You'll be able to find this and past recordings on our website and YouTube channel. Now to introduce Dr. Uh, Professor Talita Grayley. So Talita is a professor in the School of Economics at the University of Johannesburg in South Africa. She specializes in well-being economics and quality of life studies. She has a keen interest in fourth industrial revolution applications, which led her to establish the Gross National Happiness Today project. You can find the website at gnh.today. The project uses fourth industrial revolution methods and big data to construct real-time happiness and emotions data. It received the Vice Chancellor's Distinguished Award for Innovation and was also accepted as official statistical data by the Statistical Office of New Zealand. And working for the Statistical Office of Luxembourg, this is a, a major feat. I can say that. Uh, Talita is the author of numerous articles in both multidisciplinary and economic scientific journals. She is an executive board member of the International Society for Quality of Life Studies, member of the World Wellbeing Panel, research fellow of the Global Labor Organization, associate editor for Applied Research and Quality of Life, and a co-editor for the Journal of Happiness Studies. She's quite busy. She regularly participates in radio and television shows and has various podcasts and TEDx talks about measuring well-being using fourth industrial revolution methods. Particularly, I'm excited today uh, to have Talita as our speaker. Uh, she's been thinking about and utilizing new analytical techniques and sources of data for years. Uh, and I believe this is going to become an increasingly uh, important part of our jobs uh, going forward. So I'm excited to hear what Talita has to say. Uh, without further ado, we are pleased to welcome Professor Talita Grayling. Talita, the floor is yours. I'm unmuted. Thank you very much for that very nice introduction. And as I said, it's always a pleasure being with Static, being online with Static. So thank you for the opportunity. But let's start. All right, so as Kelsey already said, I am presenting on big data, sentiment analysis, and subjective well-being. All of those are very close to my heart. As I say, I don't have a job. I just like, it's my hobby, I play. So what am I going to tell you today is subjective well-being and the definition of subjective well-being, which should be very familiar to everybody. Then just a little bit, what is big data? What is sentiment analysis? I'm just touching on those. Each one of those can, there's a book on each one of them or a few. Then what are we doing in the Gross National Happiness Today project? What does our data look like? And then what are we planning for future de developments? What are we working on at the moment? And then to end it off, I'm going to show you an application of the data, how we can use it. Okay, just subjective well-being, the normal uh, definitions that we use, the basically Dina's definitions, where we can take subjective well-being, split it into two nodes, speaking already in random trees, forest uh, terminology. So we've got effect and we have life satisfaction. Now, the one that we normally interest is life satisfaction, which is a question, how, how well are you in general? How satisfied are you with your life in general? The effect measures is more short term and where we get our positive and negative effect. And positive effect will be something like, do you enjoy life? Um, do you love others? And with a negative effect, it will be more something, do you have very worries? Are you often angry? So when we look at these type of measures and we move into big data, what we do with analysis, then if we have to define what are we measuring, it's often more towards the effect size, but somewhere in the middle, but leaning over to the effect size, because they, whenever you would say tweet on something, you would have thought about it a bit, but it's also a short term effect that you measure. We are moving into the measuring the long term, the life satisfaction as well. So that's one of our projects ongoing. 
So just what is big data? Now, big data is big. So that's why it's called big data. So there's a lot of it. It's voluminous. Um, and the other thing is you can, it's, it's accessible. It is, uh, it, it's got a high velocity. You can access it continuously. So big data, I mean, I've been working with it for quite a while and there is so many benefits of big data. Where do we get big data? Now, normally, if we think of big data, you will think of something like your social media, but there's much more. If you look at health data, financial data, so all of those is sources of big data, but a lot of big data is available on the web. So even Google searches, all of that, emails, um, any post you make, that will go through as big data. If we look at the different types of big data, you get structural big data. That will be similar to your Excel spreadsheet. Then you get unstructured data. That is very often the terrain we are working in because that's text data. In analysis of text, that's all unstructured data. And then you get semi-structured data. Okay. Then advantages of big data. The main things about it is cost saving. It's much cheaper to collect than survey data except if you start buying from Elon Musk, but I will tell you more about that. Then it's time saving. So you don't have to send out somebody to survey. You can do it as quickly as you've got your processing power, you can download data. And then it gives you an opportunity to listen. There's social media listening. So if we, that's just in short, there is much, much more than we, what we can say about it, but also the way that you collect it is unbiased. Nobody knows that they're actually answering questions. They are posting something, saying something, and you can listen to that and pick up with all the bi without all the biases that you normally get with survey data. So limitations, there's plenty of limitations, and those are the ones we're working on because I so often say big data is the future. I can, there will be a place for survey, but I think we will start leaning towards big data. But for that, we must really know that the big data is accurate. It's, we get um, veracity out of the data. So the main thing is, and the questions I always get is, but it's not representative. True, it's not rep representative. But there's many ways that we can actually weight it to make it representative. And one of the people that's working on that is Iorcus, Professor Iorcus, and he's doing tremendous work on weighting the big data. Then, um, as soon as you start working with big data, you've got different methodologies that we use. So normally we would have do, done basic statistical analysis and we would have used STATA or one of your basic stats programs. With, as soon as you're starting with working with big data, it's a different field of analysis. Um, I won't say it's tougher than any statistical analysis, it's just different. And then we can't just use big data, it's not a complete substitute for survey data. It's nice to work with it, both of them. So work with them um, hand in hand because the survey data can inform you about the big data. You can derive from survey how to weight your data. So it's, it's good to have both of them. And then obviously the quality of data, we know garbage in, garbage out. So we have to make sure that the big data that we extract is really telling us what we want it to tell us. Um, I just, you know, one of the words I picked up recently is outstanding. So if you see outstanding, you normally say, oh, positive. that's a very positive thing, it's outstanding. But what if you're a bank, if you're working with bank data, then outstanding is not what you want to see on your bank data or your, on your account. So there's a lot of things that you must make sure that you, the data you actually collect is good data and representing what you intended it to present. All right, so what is the Gross National Happiness Dot Today project? We started this in 2019 and what we did is work on Twitter, extracted tweets in real time and then from the tweets that we extracted, uh, we actually constructed data. Now, fortunately, we had static and they worked with us and helped us validate the data. The countries that we worked on then was initially Australia and New Zealand and South Africa. And then with static um, working with us, we actually enlarged this whole group. So we were, we've got 10 countries there. 
uh, most of them then European countries, including there is Luxembourg as well. So sometimes our analysis doesn't include Luxembourg because the, the your sample size on Luxembourg won't always be that big. But in many of our analysis, we do include them just to see what's happening in Luxembourg as well. Then we did an interesting just for fun project during the Soccer World Cup 2022. We also extracted the data for the countries that played soccer, but that took part in the tournament. Um, so we at that stage had 16 countries. We had them running for a while and even after the Soccer Cup. And then with the rugby this year, we did the same, but we didn't have Twitter. We used Facebook to collect that data. Um, once again, just fun. It, it was really nice watching what happens to the index and watching the rugby at the same time to see if the one actually reflects in the country. I will show you more about that just now. So how do we do it? Just getting back, we extract the data in real time. Now it's, it's, it's a lot of data that we extract, even just for the 11 countries, it's more than a million tweets per day that we extract. We extract them in real time. Then in real time, we use natural language processing. Now natural language processing is basically machine learning that works with language, with people. So it's a way that we use machine learning and then we apply what we call a sentiment analysis and we also do emotion analysis. Sentiment analysis is a way how you can score the sentiment of a sentence of a tweet. So you can have it as positive, negative or neutral. Emotions, it picks up words where you then can give the different emotions of the sentence like anger or fear or sadness or joy. So we code that as we know that machines can only read coding. So once we've got the coding, we put it into what we say a balance equation, just positives and negatives. We calculate it and from there we derive an index. So we will average either per hour or per day, depending on the frequency of the data. Um, and then we've got the time series data and at a relatively high frequency. Uh, how do we do the sentiment analysis? There's different ways. There's a rule-based method, which we normally use. It's a lexicon. A lexicon is just a library that gives you certain words, and it will say these words, is, does it have a positive connection or a negative connection? We're also moving to more advanced than the just words. We've got biograms, trigrams. So if I say, uh, I love you, it's one word. If I, I can also say, I do not love you, which then will be negative. But we can pick up that a few words so to pick up that sentences. So, and continuously, natural language processing is evolving. So it's getting, uh, you're getting better measures. Um, as I said, we use rule-based, but then there's also machine learning models. So it's Rubata is coming in, which makes it more advanced. Right, so I covered all of that, and then we did a lot of validity checks on the data. We're still doing validity checks because, as I said, it's very important to see that our data actually measures what we intended to measure. So internal, we did quite a few, just looking at the time scale. So instead of um, using hours data, we use six hours data and see if we get similar patterns in the data. And then the volume, where we normally would use the data extracted or construct the index from, say, 600,000 tweets, we will just use a fraction of that, 25%, 50%, to see if the volume actually influences the, the trends and the patterns we find. And then, um, starting with the papers we worked with them, they also did some external validity. They're checking it against the Consumer Confidence um, Index of the European Commission and the average life satisfaction with the Euro barometer, and we found they're all positively correlated. So that's some of the validity. Then just a word on future. What, what's happening at this stage? Now, most of you already know that Twitter was taken over with, by Elon Musk. It's now X, it's no longer Twitter. And they actually stopped all academic research. On the 15th of May, everything was just everything was just stopped. Our systems, there was just no tweets that we could extract. Um, so Elon Musk has decided to monetize Twitter and it will cost us close to 4,000, is it now 4,000 euro per month 
to actually extract tweets. And no academic project can afford that. So all Twitter projects have stopped, which is really the end of a era where we were able to read or to find out more about the behavior of people. There were major projects running. There were PhDs working on this data. And as I say, abruptly, everything came to a stop. And we have quite a big source of data or sample of the data. So if anybody knows of anybody that needs tweets, historically, we, are, we will share whatever we have. So um, this means that we very quickly had to jump into other social media. But Twitter was ideal. It was continuously updated. Um, there was a wide variety where they had many users, Twitter users, that not, we don't really find uh, other social media platform that gives us the same uh, opportunities as Twitter. We've now used Facebook, but a lot of challenges in Facebook because you can't actually access private accounts, you're using public accounts. Then there's a lot of other social media that we're looking into it. You've got LinkedIn, you've got Reddit, um, you've got Instagram. We actually analyze the visual effects, which is really nice. Huh? Anything new I love, um, there's a lot of software already out there. We can analyze voice, we can analyze as I say, visual effects. So we're looking into all of this, trying to see how can we get the strongest index from the other social media platforms. And then just some examples. Here's our soccer, just as I say, a little bit of fun. Um, this is just to show you, that was the first game with Argentina. Uh, losing the game. So you can see here, oh, let me show you there. This is where the game started. Argentina was really positive, saying that there's no ways they can lose against Saudi. And um, they actually did lose. So you can see here the game started. Now, we usually using the time zone in Argentina, but the game was actually started at one o'clock is when you saw they started playing. And you can see they started on a high and there their happiness dropped. And they stayed low and below, below the mean. There's the mean for some time. I don't know at what stage they recovered, but we know that they won the World Cup and there we would see that they were up. The, if I looked at that graphs, they were on nines. They were really very happy about the win. And here we see our Messi and yes, so that was the World Cup. Here's another one just showing this was the one win of Germany. And because I've got so many German friends, I thought maybe I should show them um, Germany's joy in winning Costa Rica. So you can also see this is where the game started, the time in Germany, and you can see how their happiness increased over that time period. Okay, so here's the application. Uh, we used the gross national happiness data. We used all the emotions, these eight emotions, and we used the happiness score, and we applied all the data and the idea that we try and get, or what we did with this paper, is um, looking at vaccinations and COVID-19. And we now at this stage, we can look at it retrospectively. So COVID-19 is basically something in the past. Uh, vaccination data is no longer available. So we could look at what, what did work during the vaccination. So the problem is COVID-19, the whole way it was handled was an absolute disaster. It was just a big mess. Um, we can actually put it in numbers, 770 million cases that is still reported at this stage, or that was the last figures reported, 7 million deaths. Uh, so telling you that something went wrong. I said, what is the problem? The main thing to avoid a pandemic is to reach herd immunity. Now, herd immunity, you can reach it either by getting COVID and building up immunity or being vaccinated. But obviously, vaccination is the better way to go. It's avoid your deaths and being sick. So what we're trying to do here is we are trying to see which factors are most important to reach herd immunity. So initially they said, if you have a country with 70% herd immunity, then we can, the, the, we can mitigate the pandemic. Uh, with, then later on, with all the developments that happened, they see with all the mutations of COVID, that barrier was lifted and it was up to 90%. The country had to be 
um, vaccinated up to 90% of the population, and then we could actually mitigate the COVID. So the aim of the study, we are now sitting in the chair retrospectively looking at what happened during COVID, and now we can say what worked, what did not work, what should we do in the future? So giving advice for future pandemics. Also thinking about this study, in this case, it, we look at, at vaccination rates and what's the most important to vaccination rates. But we can use any of those outcome variables, there's many more that we can use in a similar way. Um, you will see that here the, the emphasis that we're trying to put here is a lot on the subjective measures. What will happiness do? What will emotions do to actually find that you can push up vaccination rates? It's got a lot to do with trust in the government. Um, how can we increase where you have government regulations? Where can you actually increase the adherence to those regulations, the compliance to the regulations? So the next question is then, does subject of well-being measures actually play a role? Because with the vaccination, it was normally objective measures, regulations, laws that came into play, but not a lot on the, are the people happy? How do they feel about this? So we bring that into our question. But what is the contributions of this study? We are fortunate because we can do this retrospectively. We can have a look at the COVID after COVID and say what worked and what didn't work. And then we are the first study that is working on vaccination rates that can bring in all the emotions of the people and the happiness and see if that plays a role. Would that influence the vaccination rate? Will more people um, agree to be vaccinated if we also consider their happiness, their emotions, and have targeted policy to get them more positive about vaccinations or whatever topic is important for the day? So this is also one of the first this type of subjective well-being measures and analysis, we use machine learning models. So we use a lot of machine learning on your natural language processing, so on language. But here we tried, we, we did something different. So here the big data was all in numbers already. Um, and what we actually did is we used a supervised machine learning model to do some predictions. So it was moving into a different terrain for us, but it's, it's really good because we get robust uh, results from this and also it's big data. So you can just throw in as many variables as you like. It's not like when we do a normal regression, you've got, you're going to overfit if you've got too many um, independent variables. With machine learning, just pile it in. The more the merrier. So that was nice to do that. So the data that we're using, is we use from the date that vaccines was actually introduced so it's 1 december 2020 to 16 december 2022 we're using the 10 countries which is currently in our data set so you can see we didn't include luxembourg here i'm sorry about that i wish we could and then we have uh, four merged data sets that we, we merged four data sets in this so we use the google COVID 19 open data it's a lovely data set with all your COVID variables, your regulations, your policies included in the data set, but also all your demographic variables. So population, geographical, there's even temperature, you will see that it will feature again. And then you have all the different countries that we included. So just to look at the gross national happiness data that we used, we used three data sets there. The one, we extracted all the tweets of all the countries we analyzed the sentiment and we got the happiness in the countries. Then the other two data sets is we looked at happiness towards certain factors. So happiness towards vaccines. So we just extracted vaccine related words and we analyzed that. So that we can say that all people happy about vaccines or they're angry about it. What's their attitude towards vaccines? And we did the same for government. So different variables, emotions, like trust in the government, which is one of the big fields at the moment. Um, you can see which words, we, keywords we used here. Also, thanks to static, that helped us a lot with that. And then the type of analysis that we did on these, we did a lexicon analysis, a so rule based. And one of the, we, we're using VADA, which is relatively advanced because VADA can read UTF-8, if you extract on that. In other words, it can also read the emojicons. 
a um, little bit more advanced, but we're always playing around with that to improve. It's continuously trying to improve what we're doing there. So what did we do? After we merged all the data sets, we had 145 variables. So as I say, it's, it's really big data. You can have as many variables as you like. But then the fun starts with cleaning the data. And like anything else, cleaning the data is probably the biggest job in or the longest time consuming part of the process. Um, where the missingness was low and at random, we could impute. Um, we imputed with the mean most of the time. And then there were a lot of data that didn't change much like population size. So there we would impute it with a number just pre the number that was missing. Then there were some variables that we had to drop with very high missingness. And I think really relevant variables. So international support, 67% um, missingness, which you expect because the frequency is high. But even with considering high frequency, the, the missingness uh, was really high, telling you that the international support was lacking. Emergency investment, the same thing. There was no emergency investment, something we should learn about or learn, learn from in future pandemics. All right, and they've also all removed very highly correlated variables like um, test cases. And then if you test more, you will obviously see more no, high levels of cases. So there we remove. We, at the end of the day, we were left with 69 variables including our output variable. Okay, so the methodology that we used is we used supervised machine learning and we used extreme gradient boosting. Now extreme gradient boosting is one of your tree, uh, like random forest tree, it's based on one of those uh, methods or algorithms. And it is really very efficient. Uh, just to put it another way, it's a, it's a small squeeze and you get a lot of juice. So it's, it's really a very effective method to use. We know that there's many other that might give you a little bit better um, outcome, but the time and the months that you spend to actually build them like your neural networks, at the end of the day, we always ask, is it worth it? So with Extreme, um, with Extreme Boost, we find it's more efficient it is computationally much lighter. So, for example, if you do a random forest, it is computationally heavy. You really have to have strong systems. It takes long. Um, you have many iterations. But with your HG boost, you shorten that process a lot. And then it outperforms most of your supervised algorithms. Uh, you will see that we will concentrate mostly on HG boost here. We will touch on random forests and decision trees just as robustness checks. But if you have a if you have XG boost, there's no reason you actually want to use anything else but XG boost. And it's been proven that it's more accurate. Um, as I said, it's more efficient. Now, just a little bit more about XG boost. I've already said it's a tree-based ensemble method. Um, it makes it there's some boosting. So with the boosting, what it means is if you've got a single tree, you will actually split it somewhere in nodes to to get different groups that um, identifiable and when when you boost you actually the weaker trees you can use them again to build new trees so you're boosting that and what you also have is the main thing which makes it more efficient is your loss functions and your regular the regularization very hard word to say functions that you use that actually um, cut some of the long process that you would have had with random forest. So that makes XG Boost really the preference of the day. Um, then I'm not going to mention much of this, but this is just about the objective function and the objective function we can also build in the loss function, which makes your optimization much quicker, much faster. And then I mentioned the regular rig. I'm not going to say that again. Okay, there is our equation that we actually estimate. Uh, also not going to spend too much on that. The f of x is our population, is the rate of uh, vaccination. So it's the number of people vaccinated over the population. Then we're working with weights here. So your betas there will be a weighting system. And what more must I say? Uh, yeah, well, in the rest of your, your simple models that you have. So I'm going to leave it at that. You can ask me questions later. 
Oh, then you start training the model. So when we train the model, you, you, we used 80% to train the model and 20% to test the model. When, so when you start training this, there will be some default settings and then you can play around with the default settings till you try to get the best fit. So we tried various fits. Um, what we looked here is for the accuracy, we used the, the RMSE. And so what you, you start running it and then you will decide on your objective function and see if it's the ideal function. You can change it. And then you will choose different tree depths. Uh, we played around with those. And then we found that seven gives us the best results. And it also will decrease your RMSE. So you're looking for the smallest root mean square error. And to you know that you've got a really good model. Then with a the random forest, so this is just robustness checks. We already know that, we'll, we'll show you just now, that the best model here was your XG boost. So with the random forest, we did something similar, but you will see there was, with the, with the actually boost, after 16 iterations, we actually found, all right, here we've got the best module and it converges. With random forest, it kept on running. I think it could have run the rest of our natural lives. And all that it did is that the root mean square root became smaller, but marginally. It's, it's with such a small margin that later on you can actually I don't include all the graphs, but you can see it actually goes parallel. There's almost no improvement in the random in the RMSE. So we stopped it at a certain stage, so after 50 trees. And then the decision tree is, is very plain because it's only one tree. So for the few nodes, I'm, I'm not actually going to say much more about that. So um, the evaluations we use here, maybe if you worked with machine learning before, you will know about accuracy and precision, etc. But we can't use this here because our output variable is a continuous variable. So as soon as you work with accuracy and precision, it's normally when you have binary variables. So we had to use with our mean squared error of your mean absolute error, and then the one that we mainly use is your root, um, root mean squared error, so RMSE. So you train your model and then you test your model on your test data and then you obviously evaluate the model and the evaluation is then when you use these different evaluation um, like looking which model will give you the smallest root mean square error. Okay, so here are the results of the models we ran. And as you can see, if we just look at the root mean square error, we can see that the HG boost is gotten 0.03. So it's really, really small. That error is really small. Random forest a little bit higher. Decision tree is not performing well, but that we know before we actually start. So you can see the XG boost, really a good fit. This graph is um, a lovely graph to show you just how good the fit is. If you look at the red line there, that will be your true values. So that will be what you get from your training. Then if you start fitting the models, you're actually running it on your test data, then you will find that you've got your XG boost, the blue line, is very close to your real values. You will see the random forest, which is the green line, is a little bit more off, and your decision tree is not performing well. So this is something we would like to see. We find a good model fit here. Oh, so what is our results? What did we find? So with machine learning, you can say which factors are most important. So it's not a coefficient. It gives you what's most important. It doesn't give you the direction. It can't say positive or negative. It was just tell you these played the biggest role in predicting the uh, vaccination rate. So if first, if we go to 70%, remember we first have tried to get all countries to be vaccinated at 70%. Just by the way, in our model, basically all countries managed to get to 70%. 70% of the population was vaccinated, except South Africa only 40%. Um, considering that South Africa were probably the advanced, most advanced countries in the developing world. So the others, some of them only got to 2% or 1% vaccination rates. But in Europe, everybody reached 70%. So what was most important there? The vaccination policy. Now vaccination policy was um, who were liable, who were, could actually go to be vaccinated. So you will remember it was different age groups, for example. So obviously that will play a role. If everybody 
were able to go for vaccination, then you will have a high vaccination rate. Then population age between 10 and 90. Very often the countries didn't allow the younger people to vaccinate. So that only came into play later on. So that played a role. That is ever. Um, then there was the international travel controls. So we know with the international travel controls, there was something that, especially in New Zealand, I remember, if you want to travel, get vaccinated. So it was something that we put in front of you like a carrot. Um, so if people wanted to travel, they vaccinated. I, I was one of them. And then the percentage of population in rural areas. We Even now, we saw that in the rural areas, there was really a problem from two sides. The one side is a lot of the rural population was against vaccinations. And on the other hand, to supply vaccines in very rural areas was quite difficult. So that lowered your, vaccin your vaccination rate. And then interesting, your temperature played a role. And when we first found that and came up with every model, we thought, okay, how did this work? But then we saw that in Europe, there was often reported um, snow, storms, and that actually limited or, or prohibited people to go for their vaccines. And then on the other hand, very tropical areas with storms and the roads and floods that couldn't get to the areas or the clinics where they were supposed to be to get vaccinated. Now, what's interesting is what we are looking at is where is our subjective measures? If we look at 70%, our happiness comes in seventh. So to increase a vaccination rate, previously, how people emotions, how they feel, the sentiment, the subjective evaluations was not considered. That didn't play a role. But now we see to encourage people to do something like get vaccinated, policymakers must also look at their happiness, their emotions, how they feel. Now to get 70%, we had happiness coming in at number seven. So it definitely played a role. There should be policy around it. But let's see what happens if you push it up to 90%. You want compliance here. If you want compliance from people, there's a lot of things that you should consider. Now, from our research, we saw that to encourage vaccination, one of the big things was about trust. Trust in the vaccine, trust in the government, and then the emotions of the people. If you have people negative, and that can be due to anything, because they don't believe in the government, there's corruption, um, there were laws that actually forced them to go vaccinate. As soon as you get that negativity, you can't get them to step up to the next level of 90%. So to get to the extreme of reaching something above the norm, 70%, everybody reaches 70% vaccination rate in the developed world. But to push it up to 90%, they had to consider how people feel. They had to consider the emotions. And no country reached 90%. The closest is Spain. Spain got to 89%. Not one of the other countries got to that 90%. And I think a lot of it's got to do with the policy that should consider emotions and sentiment of people, which is not really there yet. Okay, so those are our results. Just mentioning some limitations of the study. Um, the one thing is that those variables that I think is really important. So uh, international support and cooperation, and also your uh, investment in emergency funds that we couldn't include in this data set. If we could, probably that will be one of those factors that's really important. And then uh, the sample of the countries. We obviously would have liked a much bigger sample, a much more representative sample, not only with developed countries, but more developing countries. So just to conclude, I think I'm still on time, I hope, is what factors overlap if we looked at 1970% and they are the following vaccination policy, the international travel controls, the percentage of the population in rural areas and the average temperatures. If we then look at happiness, we can see that happiness or your subjective measures really plays a big role. So if you want to reach above the norm, you need to take into consideration people's feelings, their behavior, their emotion towards a certain topic. Maybe in future it won't be vaccines, maybe it will be something different, but it's something that policymakers need to pay attention to. It's, it's, it's really important and as a well-being economist, I mean, I, can't, I cannot emphasize this enough. 
your data needs to be expanded to bring in the subjective side of measures as well. We can't just use objective measures for policy making. And that's my story. Thank you very much, Talita. That's uh, rather interesting. Uh, so uh, for the various participants, you can raise your hand, uh, virtual hand, or uh, write in the chat if you have a question. I saw Anthony's hand. Um, I think he might have. Is that a class? I was I was clapping, but I also have a question. Hello, the leader. Anthony. Uh, Anthony, it's great seeing you. How are you? Before you ask. I'm good. Thank you very much. Um, no, like, I mean, I, I have a question for you because like, it's something actually we, you know, that we mentioned during this call, but I did not realize, you know, like with Elon Musk and basically the end of Twitter, but, I mean, you know, Twitter being free for research, then what do we do with this poor PhD student who started their, you know, their thesis working on this kind of data? So what, what are the solutions? Like, can we pay now for the data or what's, uh, what's the deal? It is so expensive. I can't see that anybody can pay for it. But as I said, we've got a lot of data. And whatever we can help any student with at this stage, if they can work on historic data, um, please, we are here to help one another. Let them contact us and we will share what we have. Mm -hmm. But is there is there any way that you could somehow reach out and try, you know, to make your case? Like, is it something that is completely possible or or not? I know that. I mean, these there are so many big research projects. Um, like Vermont University has been running an index. Well, on Twitter as well. Oh, I don't know for how many years they were not able to do anything. Harvard themselves. There are so many projects, especially in the behavioral side. So looking at the narratives. And Elon Musk doesn't even read. I mean, we tweet and we ask him. They, I mean, we don't expect that he will read tweets, but somebody in his staff probably will. And we had no reaction. It was just shut down. There was a warning at the end of last year. And, but it was, he said it will probably go on for the academia. And then on the 15th of May, everything was just shut down. What do you think, Talita, about news sources uh, like Fitbit, for example? Is it possible to gain access? Uh, you may have to purchase the data uh, like you would have to purchase from Twitter and other smart devices in the next coming years. Because uh, I didn't hear, did you mention a media platform? Uh, a Fitbit, Fitbit. Do you, you know the, the device that people Fitbit, wear? Yes, yes and other types of smart devices that people might uh you know wear more and more going forward or use more i was more. actually contacted by somebody with our government with all that data that's got all your heart rate etc and they were adding on where they actually actually bleeped out time use data so they will have a beeper and they will ask people certain questions which is really nice. It gives us a nice opportunity, but the data is still limited. That product was specifically in South Africa. So South Africa's um, health insurance is really advanced. And like our banking systems, if you come and visit, you will see it's really, really advanced. And they've implemented it, but that's only in South Africa. So that gives us an opportunity. The other, other opportunity is that we develop something or that we actually go with somebody that has developed and just add questions. So we'll have an app in the market. But um, we're looking into various things, trying out, uh, applying for funding, especially to develop an app. And then with an the app, we would also like people to maybe just record a story and then we can use that voice recognition and um, analyze the sentiment. But it's all things that we're looking into, it, but nothing happening at the moment. So still applying for grants and seeing what is the options. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Joel. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself. Joel, I'm sorry, I, I'm not hearing you. Anybody else? Is, are you capturing him? No, I, I'm not hearing anything either. Oh. Uh, go ahead, try again. Uh, hello, are you hearing me now? Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. So, first of all, thank you for the very interesting presentation. 
Uh, yes, the Twitter issue, I'm fully aware because I had a PhD student who actually just finished uh, and I must shut everything down. And unfortunately, what's happening is that there are other platforms such as Reddit. They made it prohibitively expensive as well to use their API. Uh, in fact, my question was this. Uh, you mentioned that you shifted on to other social media. I know for sure that, for example, because even Facebook following Cambridge Analytica, Facebook had also closed a lot of their APIs. So can I ask what's, what social media data are you using? What, uh, what sort of replacement are you trying for Twitter? Okay. You know, at the, the, our first project was using Facebook, but it's also not easy because there's a lot of licenses and off to Twitter, everybody stopped giving out license. Um, we managed to get a Facebook license, which also gives us access to Instagram. So we've done an index on Facebook, but as I say, it's still a prototype. Uh, it's different to Twitter because, you know, you post something and then somebody will comment on a post. But that can continue for two or three days. It's not what a once off. So it's very different. It brings out many challenges. So we've only used Facebook as yet. Uh, we're moving into other ideas. Um, quite, a, quite a nice few ideas. I'm very excited. I was really very busy up to now. But now it's in the, the southern hemisphere. Everything is now. It's, we are going into summer holidays. So it gives me extra time. So I'm really eager to start exploring the other options. And as soon as I've got something to share with you, I will. Okay. But we will um, manage. We're going to get it right. We will show Elon Musk we can work without Twitter. No, I know for sure Elon Musk's intention is to shut off research. In fact, uh, there was an outburst, uh, quite a profane outburst, because uh, 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 was attacking even the advertisers. I mean, he's that kind of guy. But uh, have you also considered a uh, discourse? Because, for example, in Malta, we use uh, lots of lots of uh, uh, newspapers. For example, they have their comments, their comment section. They are powered by discourse. And discourse, they used to offer an API. But I'm not sure if they're still offering it or not. Can you share that with me? I'm sure that you will have my email address. But looking at newspapers, newspapers is an option and you can web scrape them. Um, but I'm saying because well, the comments what? surrounding the newspaper that's powered by discourse. That that might be. We we will think and try various things. There's a few problems. Which newspapers do you follow? So I'm there are so many. Uh -huh. And and then if you just think of you've got your left, your right, your normally not in the middle, which ones do you choose, especially if you go globally? Uh, the same with Facebook. You have to pick certain pages. Which ones do you pick to make it a representative sample? All of those questions come up when you start looking into these things. Um, there's always, but there's always a way around. We will make a plan. We will get yeah. some wind. We will make a plan, but it might take some time. The once again, the accuracy of the data is so important. The validity, but we've got the Twitter data at least to have some external validation for a new index. But it's but not going to be as easy as we thought initially. We just thought, oh, let's go over to Facebook, and then we found the one problem after the other. And if I may ask, how do you filter? Because you used to use the the academic stream, no? From Facebook, there was the the pipeline. I don't remember the exact terminology they used to use. Uh, but did you use to use all the all the tweets coming through that stream, or did you use to do some filtering? We used we used everything we could. So we used the academic uh, stream, and uh -huh. then we also used private Twitter keys. So to get the maximum amount of okay. tweets that we can, but then you had to look for duplication and things like that. Yeah, data. obviously. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question that piggybacks on uh, both of these uh, comments. So uh, discus uh, is something I have only seen, I think once or twice. And so Joel, I wonder if you may say how many comments have you seen on a particular post? And so if it's five or 20, then my question to you, Talita, is how many comments do you think you need to be able to get something that you would consider reliable? Uh, and so I'm thinking in the case of tweets, 
uh, you know, maybe it's 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 100 or 300 or or, or something uh, even larger, and then in which case you would need a similar number of comments perhaps on a post. Uh, it, and discuss is a, a discuss. Uh, I, I think is a something. It's a platform that's used across multiple uh, outlets. If I understood correctly, uh, Joel, I don't. Maybe it's used a lot in Malta, but I've only seen yeah. it once. Okay, no, in Malta it is uh, because in Malta people in Malta they 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 don't and Twitter did not have such a. Uh, it was used, but it it was not used that much. Uh, but uh, there was the, uh, well, uh, Malta, given it's a small island, th there are the major newspapers, they all use Discus. And, uh, for example, if you analyze the feeds from Times of Malta, you can get a feel of what's happening in Malta, because then you, uh, you, you aggregate, you, you log in with your own account, and you find some people who prolific who profit prolifically you know they just comment on everything and you can sometimes realize that some people are hardcore for example with a certain party because you'll see them constantly commenting for example in favor of the government or consistently against the government so in Malta, yes, if, if we are to analyze, for example, in Malta, discourse is used quite a lot because the major newspapers, which I'm saying there are about three or four, which is obviously different cases. I mean, when you compare to other places, it's used a lot. So that's why I suggested it. I'm not aware of, of its penetration in the market elsewhere, however. And Talita, how many? If, if, we, if we look at the posts, we looked at Facebook. Now we looked only we are for our we only looked at the rugby pages during the rugby World Cup, and there you found quite a lot of posts. So after the game, it went up to a thousand, two thousand, and now that's quite a good sample. But <laughs> that was for an event. Normally the post and also the time period for how long will you follow whatever your comments are on a post? There's a post, and then it's all your comments. And the comments normally come through with Facebook as emoji, emoji cons. So um, there's not very often that people will actually comment and write something. So it's normally uh, a like or they share it or they will say there's an angry face. So it, it makes it harder because you need to add up how many you have and then bring on some calculations. We used to put it at our period, but you will have to play around with it. And once again, we don't know with a public page, if you have enough pages, then you have to look at the post and then you have to look at the reactions on the post. So it just makes the whole process much longer. Where we had with Twitter real-time data coming through, Facebook, you can't. You will have to have some delay to see what was their reactions to a post. And then, as you mentioned, you don't know how many reactions you will get. It depends. Thanks, Francesco. Hi, Dalita. Good, good afternoon. Good evening, actually. Great to see you. Um, Wonderful to see you. And thanks for sharing your work with us. Uh, I'm, I'm actually quite curious about uh, um, uh, some of the details behind your uh, emotional analysis, because I understand that compared to the work we've done together uh, some time ago at this point, um, your algorithm improved by, uh, for instance, managing uh, emojis, and, and so I would like to ask if you could share with us a little bit more, uh, how did you handle this? How did you handle, for instance, different languages and, uh, and different characters? As uh, at the time, this we, was also a little bit of a, of a bottleneck. Is it, well, as we go on, obviously we're getting better. And it's always research and development. We're trying to improve. The emo emoji or the emotion analysis has not developed as well as the sentiment analysis. So the emotion analysis, the libraries we have there, is still not working on emojis. It's it's not on UTF-8, but sentiment is. So it depends on your library and how advanced your library is. So text blob is the next generation where it can analyze text, but it's still just sentiment. So with the sentiment, you can include emojis. So when you extract data, it actually improve, can include your emojis, which is now a big way to express emotion. 
Uh, your emotion libraries don't have the emoji cons in yet. So I see these developments. And as soon as we have a library rule based, we will move to that. And we're also investigating the machine learning options coming through. So the machine learning is very different because the emoji with lexicons is rule based. So these words, unigrams, trigrams, biograms, where they actually interpret certain words with a certain sentiment or emotion. So that is your rule based, what we've been using up to now. But your machine learning is different because your machine learning is a classification. So it will group certain words together. Um, there's also, often if you have very strong analytics into it, your rule base still give you a more pure uh, answer outcome. But this machine learning is getting progressively more advanced. If you look at just natural language processing, if you think of that, AI work with natural language processing. You write in text and it analyzes that and gives you a result. So the advances we are making is incredible. I can't wait. The AI that's available and on text now. So I think in future we will get a much better product. Uh, we will probably need a smaller sample. So I mean, I'm I'm watching daily what's happening in the developments in especially with text analysis, what, what is happening, where we're we going to. And I must say, initially, machine learning was not that strong, but those models are getting better and better as we go on, more sophisticated. Thank you very much. Cassie, do you think uh, I still have a chance for a question, or there is someone else who has raised his hand? I can? Uh, do you still hear me? Yes, I do. Yeah, sorry. Because while you were talking, you know, I was thinking about uh, the, the validity of this of these numbers and the fact that uh, um, now this statistics is being used in New Zealand, and the need of statistical offices to use uh, you know valid uh, and reliable numbers. So I wonder if uh, and to what extent you manage to test the validity and reliability of the constructs you derive from these techniques. So can, do you think a statistical office can indeed trust these, uh, these numbers? That's, that's a question I always ask myself, you know, is to what, to what degree do we get valid measures? And you, I mean, you, you all used some of the validations. And I think as we go on, our data will be, will, the validity will improve. But it's a lot about the big data. If you look at it, it's the garbage in, garbage out. So when you, you extract the data to look at duplication, missingness, that's the basic things. But very often with text is the word play. For example, bank and bank, the one you sit on and the one that you put your money in. So if you extract on that one word, what, what, what do you get out of it? And at this stage, it's still really uh, labor intensive. So we still do it old school and read through many of them to see sort of what is the noise you pick up. But it's really about the, how valid your data is. But the methods are getting better, especially the machine learning, picking up those things as well. So I, at some stage, we're going to be able to trust big data. And I will also think that we use big data hand in hand with survey data. I don't think we, at some stage, we will be able to use any big data. I don't know if it will be in our lifetimes, uh, because I always feel, look at survey data as well, as a guideline. But methods are improving at such a, a rate that I really think that at some stage, our big data is going to be, be very little garbage and we will be able to trust it. Even now, even with, with the methods we use, if you look at the Rugby World Cup, if you look at the soccer, what you see in the data is what you expect. I mean, it reflects what you say. So even just that is very intuitive. But if, if I look at the data and I look at the game and I see what happens and the data reflects what's happening there, how can I not trust my data? Uh, I, I, I see your point and I agree with what you say. Uh, it's just that I keep having Angus Ditton critique in, my, in the back of my head when he says that uh, in the end happiness would capture the circus of life and miss the bread. So that is my worry. But, but thanks a lot. I see your point. Thanks, Talita. 
anyone else? Questions? We still have, we're just at six o'clock uh, Central European time. Uh, but Talita, if you don't mind staying another minute, we can still ask a question. Anyone else? I, I have questions for you still. Um, and actually it's uh, related to the, the algorithm that you were using uh, at the end. So I was a bit confused by you know, the structure of the, the data. So you have 10 countries over time. Did you aggregate to the week then, and then you did a panel analysis, uh, you know, or you use daily data uh, by country? We, we use daily data. But Kelsey, I must tell you, when I started off with the machine learning, it's so different to normal econometric analysis. Uh -huh. You break all the rules. Uh -huh. It's like a big basket and you chuck everything in and yeah. then, so it, it's very different. And the result that you receive is uh, you get a, the um, certain variables, let's say, are, are significant in the, in the classic sense, but they're not indicated as being positive or negative. So my question, what, what do you do with this information? I'm thinking it could be used for data exploration analysis, and then you learn which variables are important. You drop the ones that are not important, and then you could build a, a more structural analysis. Or um, uh, I'm not sure what, what you do with this information. Well, the point is, you. I think, as I said, I think machine learning is really strong, and your results that you get from there is really strong. It tells you, it doesn't give you a coefficient. It doesn't give you um, the, if it's positive or negative. It doesn't, but. You've got theory there to back you a lot. And the possibilities of the number of variables that you can add in. There's just so many more. If you look at the results we get, is with population, rural population or not. You don't have it in a normal model that we actually build. You can't put it in temperature. There's so many things because we have to add variables that's got variation the whole time. With machine learning, you don't have to do that. So you can bring in many more facets than we can do with normal analysis. And what we have here is those variables that comes up the most in trees, that's most often seen, most often identified, which then plays the most important role in predicting your outcome variable. Okay. So it's, it's not necessarily exactly, it's not the same as your normal econometric analysis. But right. I think it gives you a lot of information and a lot wider information that you actually can derive from it. Just okay, the fact that you can put in 70 variables into an equation and you don't overfit. Mm -hmm. um, great. I, I think at some point we'll, we'll talk more about this, uh, and so, but we'll save it for another time. Uh, uh, Daniela Andren uh, commented that you might also be able to consider Spotify data. And is another source of, of big data. I was thinking of uh, something similar. Uh, our colleague actually used Weibo, uh, you know, the big Chinese, uh, you know, it's somewhat equivalent yes. to Twitter. I, I don't yes. know if it's changed. So that might be, of course, it's restricted to one country, uh, but, you know, a massive one. Uh, so that's it's another. It's not sample size. Yeah. Uh, I was also thinking if you could work with Google and use their search and maybe if they still have mobility data, you also have the data on the lights at night. Uh, so you have other forms of, of big data. The NASA, NASA data. Um, yeah, so there's a few, uh, sorry, I just got a message. Uh, a few other sources and I'm thinking going forward, what you partially need to improve upon validity is the representativeness and then it might be working with a, a big brother state, also like China, using cameras on the streets, uh, as well as traffic patterns, uh, other things like that. And then maybe you can get at uh, some, uh, some greater penetration rates and representativeness. So we are really exploring it. I didn't even want to mention Google because Google's my next project. Um, obviously, if you type a question to Google, it must be stored in a database. But we can't get access to that. But it would be wonderful if you just think how many questions you type into Google. 
And that is really listening without people knowing. Social media, people, some, they know. If you write something, somebody's going to read it. If you put a search into Google, you don't expect somebody's going to read it. So you get a more objective way of listening. Um, but, I mean, it must there must be a data source. There must be some type of text analysis, AI behind it. But up to now, we can't get into the Google data source where we can actually see the question. That will be the ideal. So give me time. I'm working on all of this. I'm thinking of many of these things. There's Google Trends, but Google Trends is different. It's So we're looking into various of these options. Spotify is a nice option I haven't thought of. Thanks, Carl. That's something I can look into. And um, but But really, if you've got ideas, please share them. We are really working very hard and we're trying now, um, especially now that we've got a little bit of a break from teaching and supervision, not really supervision, but to use this time to see what we can come up with and test it. Great. Uh, just to be clear, I can't take credit for the Spotify. That was uh, Daniela Andren. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, if anybody has a last burning question, now's the time. Otherwise, Talita, if you have any last uh, points for us. We'll the only thing that I want to say is if you have any ideas, please share them. This paper that I presented now has not been published yet. It's actually part of a book that we wrote. So if you have any comments, the book is submitted, but we can all, there's always revisions coming up. So any ideas to make the work stronger, to make our research stronger will be much appreciated. Great. Thank you, Talita, and thank you to all of the participants. Uh, We'll put this Thank up you, everybody. Soon. Lovely seeing all of you. Thanks again. Right. Have a nice evening. Keep well. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Bye bye.